always a privilege for me sharing God's word with you and to be here with you today as such. Well, I suppose the election season uh, is now in full swing since the last of the conventions is over and, and uh, both the parties are now busy at the business of trying to win an election. And in this instance, uh, the party is of no consequence really. Both are out there trying to, to complete their mission. Hundreds and thousands of volunteers are out campaigning, registering people, voters, working to see that their candidate wins, and that's what we see every election cycle here in this country. And if you think about it, we've been thinking, we've been talking about for the past several weeks about missions, right? The, the mission of the apostles, uh, how Jesus had prepared them, uh, the book of Acts, how that shows us in what we've been studying. And when we, like Christians, are not unlike even uh, what we see going on with people volunteering for the elections. Uh, we, we're supposed to get out and interact with people, uh, talking to people about Jesus. And uh, as far as uh, the outcome, we know that the Lord wins uh, already. We don't even have to worry about that part. But uh, but do we do that? Do we, and I, and I continue to encourage as, as homecoming and revival is just around the corner, and, and I hope that maybe we take the opportunity to uh, go with the study that we've been in for the past several weeks with the apostles and, and how Jesus prepared them, was teaching them and preparing them for their mission to begin. And, and the Holy Spirit give them the power to, to do what we studied last week on the day of Pentecost. But that doesn't mean that their work stopped on the day of Pentecost, nor does it mean that our work does not have importance and should not be carried on. So uh, what I'd like to remind us of, uh, what was the results of the apostles going out and beginning, their, just beginning their mission, we recall? There was 3,000 added to the church that first day, right? Well, uh, they continued their mission, and I want us to hopefully begin or continue our mission as well. Turn with me over into the Gospel of Mark. Verse 16, we're going to look at, uh, at this uh, specific passage of Scripture that uh, he records. Verses 15 and 16, Mark writes, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believeth in, and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Some of your translations may say condemned. Case by not hearing, not believing, not being baptized, Christ says we are condemned or we are damned. So Jesus gives his followers, that's us included, specific instructions on what we're to do to go into the world and preach the gospel. He's not suggesting that we do that. He's not saying if you have time to go do that. He's not saying even if you can fit that into your schedule. And it doesn't inconvenience you too bad. I'd like for you to do that. He says, go, go ye. And that's what he's telling us to do there. Matthew 28 and Luke 24 also record this passage of Scripture, or about the same command, I should say. And something that we rarely have the opportunity to do is to read them all together as maybe one narrative on this. So I put it together and it would sound something like this if it were written into one. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. All authority has been given me in heaven and in, on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So we see here that Jesus gave specific instructions to follow. And if you look at all three of those, instances you see it is 
much like a teaching like he did with the disciples as he was on his ascension and then also empowering uh, us to, to have confidence that, that he uh, gives us the authority to go out and do that work and then tells us what we are to teach, all things that he commanded and the path toward salvation. So we are equipped in all things through the word of God to do the same mission that the disciples did. Now we'll look at those just a little bit as we, as we look at what he said. Go. That's the first thing he said. Go ye into all the world. And that means that we must be out in the world teaching, preaching, living the gospel word or deed, sharing the good news. Now we think about Jesus and his disciples and apostles, all of those folks that followed, three years traveling, three years traveling around small towns or large towns to preach to the Jews the Messiah. They did not build a church. They didn't select a high traffic area and say, oh, well, we'll have a lot of exposure if we build our church here. Notice that they didn't build a church. They went out to the people. Now, I'm not knocking churches. I'm just saying they didn't build a church. They were together for three years, and he had a mission, but that mission was not to build a building and go to it and expect people to come to him. No, Jesus and his disciples went to the people. They went out among the people. Now, we do that already. We're out and about every day whether we go to work or go to school or, or whether we go grocery shopping or on vacation, we're out among the people each and every day in most cases. But certainly once a week, we'll say, even though some of you that may be retired and don't, don't get out that much, but we're still out. So we still have the opportunity to share the gospel. I want you to be reminded, Mark chapter 6, verse 7 through 12, he sent them out in pairs, and we oftentimes just get locked in on, on this particular passage. Even. Mark chapter 6, 7 through 12, it says, And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth two by two, and gave them power over unclean spirits, and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no strip, no bread, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals, and not to put on two coats, and he said unto them, In whatsoever place ye enter into the house, there abide till ye depart from the place. And whatsoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for the testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, It shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in that day of judgment than for that city. Notice again, he didn't say go out and find us a good place to build a church. He didn't say go out and, and go rent a building. He said go out and wherever you can find lodging to take that and preach. And if they won't hear you, don't be discouraged. Just shake it off. Shake the dust of that city off your feet and move on to the next spot. Now what's that for us? Does that mean that, that whenever we, we try to, to begin a conversation or try to be a witness to someone, we should follow that same path, that same pattern? Just because someone rejects us doesn't mean we should stop sharing the gospel with people or stop trying to, to be Christ to people. It just means that we shake it off and go on to the next one. He, he said go, and he sent these disciples out. And, and it wasn't just the twelve. If you look over in the Gospel of Luke, you'll see that Luke records that it was a few more than twelve. Luke chapter 10, the first twelve verses. Luke chapter 10, the first twelve verses. And after these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse, nor strip, nor shoe, nor salute no man by the way. And into what 
whatsoever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the son of peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remaineth, eateth, and drinketh such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. And into whatsoever city you enter, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. And heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, The kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. But whatsoever city you enter, and they receive you not, go your ways, and into the streets on the same day, and say, Even in the very dust of your city, which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than that city. So again, we see that same warning. The rejection uh, comes with great consequence. But he sent 70 more aside from the 12. 41 pairs went out to 41 different cities. That says that's where Jesus is going to go. He says, I, and that's what he empowered them to do was to go out and share the gospel. And that's the way that we should look at our service as Christians. It is our job to share the gospel wherever we find ourselves, Amen. wherever we're at. I'm not saying that you have to go out and 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 carry your Bible under your arm, and when you see someone in the store, smack them in the forehead with the Bible. And, and ask them if they know Jesus as their Savior. You're probably not going to be real successful if that's your, if that's your uh, motive, if that's how you're going to operate. But being Christ to someone is much more than that, and I don't think that's what we see uh, Christ being. Is meeting people where they are. We're going to see that here in just a minute. Helping someone in the name of Christ. Maybe someone just needs a kind word, a hello, a smile, a how are you today? That may open up a conversation. It may not be nothing, but it may change that person's day because of one smile, one act of kindness could change that day for that person who maybe had a bad day. So Jesus sent these out. Look what happened in verse 17. You think, well, I wonder, wonder how that worked out for them. Luke 10, 17. And the 70 returned again with joy saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. So they went out and they were successful because of what reason? Was it their own power? No. It was because they followed the instructions of Christ, and because of that, they were successful. If they would have went out and done something on their own or something that Christ had not told them to do, then I am sure they would not have been successful. And that's the same thing for us. We just need to follow what Jesus tells us to do. We will be successful in what we are called to do and what we, how we are supposed to do it. So when we do something in the name of Jesus, the way Jesus expects it to be done, we can expect it to return uh, some uh, profit. Maybe not something we'll see immediately. As I said, maybe a, a smile and a hello, how are you today? could change someone's course of the day for that whole day and we never know it because we may not see that person again in life but it could change that person's course of that day when we're out there treating people the way Jesus would have us to do what else did he tell them to do he said go ye into the world and what preach the gospel to every teacher, creature well preaching and teaching is very close to the same very close to the same. And that's what we have to do. Sound doctrine. Uh, the doctrine of the disciples. The doctrine of Christ. How else will people know if they are not taught? We don't expect our children to, to go to, we don't send them to school and we put them in a classroom together and not have a teacher, right? Because we couldn't expect a child to self-teach himself what they need to know at any grade level. No, we supply someone there to help them. They're called teachers. And they even sometimes have teacher's aides in their classes, right? Now, what's their purpose? Is to help the kids learn. I know, that's really, that's really elementary, Rob. Yes, it is. But it's no different with the scriptures. It's no different with you and I as a Christian. If I know something that you don't about the Bible, and I'm 
able to teach you, that's my job as a Christian to do that. It's all of our job to do that. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. But you may have understanding in something that a younger person or an older person, just someone that does not have as much biblical knowledge has, and you may be able to help them learn and increase their knowledge about the Lord. To teach. Here's a good example over in Acts. You're familiar with this, most likely. Acts chapter 8. You folks, I've preached on it before. Remember Philip and the eunuch? That's what we're coming to, Acts chapter 8, 26 through 40. Philip and the eunuch. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is a desert. And he arose, and he went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all of her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, and read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? He asked him. And he said, How can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of scripture where he read was, and he was led like sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb done before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. And in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh this prophet? Of the prophet this of himself or some other man. And then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they both, they down both, in, went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized. And when the, they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went away on his way rejoicing. Teaching. Teaching. That was the result of that. Do we see that? Now, I want to be the first to say, I'm probably not going to be able to chase you down in a chariot if you're riding a chariot down the highway or in a car. I sure ain't going to attempt that. And I don't expect any of us to be able to be to do what the angel had power, empowered Philip to do. But how many times have we had the opportunity to help someone have a better understanding of the scriptures or who Jesus is or what is expected and we just didn't do it? that we just didn't do it. And I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad, but listen, if you know the Bible and you know someone's reading in the Bible and what they're saying about what they're reading and they're saying it wrong, they're interpreting it wrong, they don't have an understanding. Whose position or whose place is it to, to, to help them? Who? I mean, let's look at, let me go back to the classroom. If we have our children in second grade and they're and they're learning about English, some part of speech, and they just don't get it right, whose job is it to correct the child so that they can learn it correctly? The teacher, because of what? The teacher has the knowledge of how to correct the child. If we have the knowledge of the scriptures, and we know what the scripture says, we have the knowledge and the duty to correct someone that is wrong. I'm not telling you to be mean about anything. Just like the eunuch said, Who's this, who is this prophet writing about, himself or some other man? And that's where he took off from right there and was talking about Jesus to the point that what happened? Who asked about baptism? 
baptism in that passage. Did Philip say, would you like to be baptized? Or did the eunuch say, well, there's some water. What prevents me from being baptized? So his teaching was sufficient enough that the eunuch had a full understanding that what Jesus had said, remember what he said? Baptizing them. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He had enough of an understanding that he took Jesus at his word and, and he said, well, there's some water. What prevents me from being baptized? And, and what did Philip say? That you believe with all your heart. And what did the eunuch say? The same thing we take here in the, the confession. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's belief. That's hearing, right? Part of the plan of salvation. I'm jumping ahead just a little bit. That's believing. telling about what you come from because what you come from we all come from something before we were Christians and none of us hopefully are what we were then so there's nothing wrong with sharing with someone where I came from so that I may could help them to get from where they are to where I am or toward where I am or beyond where I am and that's in relationship with Christ and we see evidence First Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. And this is a good, a good little passage of scripture for you to mark down if you know people in your life that says, well, I've done so much bad stuff, there's no way I can be forgiven. There's no way that, that God can, can forgive me because of all the bad that has happened and has done in my life. Well, listen to what Paul says. Verse 12, 1 Timothy 1, verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful by putting me into the ministry. Who was before, now this is Paul describing himself. Who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly. grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter Believe on him to ever, life everlasting. Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, and only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. If Paul calls himself the chief of sinners, we can take his word for it. Because he had both sides of the coin. 
He was, as he said, he was injured. He was a persecutor of the church. He went out and did grievous things to people. But yet he says and recognizes that he obtained mercy because of Christ. Not only mercy, a ministry. And that's where everyone is. And that's what people don't understand about the great love that God has for us. Not only is he going to forgive you for all of that stuff that's holding you back in your past, that the devil is wanting you to say, you'll never make it, kid, because you've just done too much bad stuff. There's too much luggage you've got to drag around. And that's the thing about it. There is no such thing as luggage when you enter into a relationship with Christ. You leave it checked at the door, and you get to start off new. It's forgotten. It's forgiven. And you're going to be given a new name as for Christian. And you're going to be receiving guidance through the Holy Spirit to leave that behind and build a new future. And that's how a witness works. I am not, and I'm standing here today, I am not who I was 40 years ago. I'm just not. I was raised up in church, and I'm not who I was 40 years ago. I'm not saying that I've sinned more than Paul, but I've sinned my share. Plenty. Plenty. But I'm not that anymore. And it's not because of Rob. It's because of Jesus Christ. It's because of God. It's because of his love and his mercy that he has for me. If it was not for God, if it was not for Christ, it's untelling where I would be today. I would have continued in that pattern, most likely. But I certainly wouldn't have been here. I wouldn't have been standing here. I wouldn't have been serving in this capacity. That's all a witness takes. I once was, but now I am. And what's the difference? Who defines that part? Christ defines what I am. The world, Satan, to find what I was before. And Paul's example here is excellent. You can never do too many bad things to go to heaven. The power of the blood of the Son of God overshadows any sin that we can see. Any. Very plain. Very plain. And as I said last week, imagine if the disciples on the day of Pentecost decided, nah, I'm not going to do this. I'm going back fishing. Lord Peter said, I'm going fishing. I've still got my boat and my nets. I'm going fishing. Imagine. We can't. We don't have the option as Christians not to serve. Not to do what God has equipped us to do. So what's the, what's the final thing that we look at? Just do a little, one more little slide up there. It's about the plan of salvation. And you can see that in all of what we've read and studied this morning you got to hear the good news of the gospel of Christ, right? I mean, one way or another, either someone has to speak it to you or you have to read it. Or a combination of both. You have to hear it. So then what happens? Once you hear it, once you learn it, you believe it. Remember the eunuch? Philip told him what, what he was reading. And the eunuch believed it, right? Because all of a sudden, the eunuch's life had changed. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, but he didn't know about Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And that's what Philip told him about with Jesus. He was already there worshiping God. He just didn't know about his son, the Messiah, the Christ. And then the confession. I believe that Christ is the son of God. And then we repent of our sin. Because once we realize that, once we hear it, we believe it, and we confess Christ as our Savior, we realize what my sin put Jesus through. My sin was one of the things that was Jesus' hands and feet were nailed to the cross. But me, not me. Once we realize that, and we say, I'm not going back to that. I repent of that. I'm not going to crucify Christ again. All over and over and over. Keep living in that sin. I am repenting, turning away of that sin, and I'm moving forward. I need forgiveness of my sin. How is it that I do that? I'm going to quote the eunuch. There is water. What prevents me from being baptized? 
And what does Jesus say? Baptize of Peter say on the day of Pentecost. Men, when the men said, what must we do? We studied this last week. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, for the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when we are buried in water and raised, we have the cleansing of sin, and we also have the empowering of the Holy Spirit to help us begin to build a life faithful to the Lord. That's the last part, being faithful. Being faithful until death or until Christ returns, whichever comes first. And I think that's a valid thing to say today, whichever comes first. Because I think this generation will see Christ return. I believe that the generation that are alive today will see the return of Jesus in the clouds coming from the east. I believe they will see the, the graves bust open. Those that are dead in Christ shall rise and meet Christ up in the air, and then the remaining will be called away. I believe that's going to be said. If I didn't believe it, I wouldn't be here. Because that's what the book says. It's what God's word says. So if we don't think it's important for each of us individually to follow the command that Jesus gave, we might have some work to do ourselves. And hopefully if you came in here not understanding completely today, I, I hope the study has changed. Helped you understand a little, little better. A little more important, the importance of what we do. Maybe there's someone here today. Maybe there's someone here today right on the edge, kind of like the Ethiopian. You hear me? They have a little bit of knowledge, but they don't know Jesus. They, they understand a little bit about the scriptures, but they don't know and didn't understand until today how much God truly loves them. And he loved them so much that he sent his son here to first and foremost teach, to give us these lessons so that we can learn to serve in a more pleasing way, but so that he could also take the penalty for our sins. And that maybe they'll take the advice of the eunuch and, and understand that once you know who Jesus is and once you know what Jesus does, you have no choice but to confess Christ as your Savior. That's available to you today. Maybe you're a Christian already, and you realize, you know what? I've just not been so free to share the gospel. I've just not been so free to try to be Christ to somebody. Try to do what Christ would have me to do each and every day. I encourage you to do that. We've got revival coming up. And typically in revival, we don't have even the attendance. Well, I'm not talking about homecoming now. I'm talking about revival. One of the first years that we were not outpaced by visiting churches as far as attendance. It is about equal. We had about as many people from Locust Grove would come that was visiting from other churches. But notice what I said. It was other churches and Locust Grove people, which is great. I want us to come and hear good messages. But you know who I want to hear good messages also? The people that don't know Jesus. I want us to be in prayer for Clayton as he prepares his messages for the upcoming two weeks from today. Remember what I asked last week? Or if it stuck in anybody's mind, I'm going to ask it again today. Did anybody pray for somebody to be saved today before you come to church? You may as well get used to me asking you that question. Because I want us to be in that kind of mindset. I want us to be in the mindset that whenever I come to church today, I'm going to offer my worship to God, but I also want the lost to be saved because that's what the disciples were sent to do. And that's what we are Christians are supposed to be doing is to p introduce people to Jesus Christ who came to seek and to save the lost. So I encourage you to do that. And if you didn't pray this morning for somebody to be saved, I encourage you to, to do that next week when you come. I'm not going to do a one call to remind you. Because the thing about it is, I want it to be on your heart, not on your tongue. I want us to have that kind of heart for the lost. Well, 
Some say it's him being patient. Salt being tender. You have a decision to make this morning. I invite you to come as we stand and sing.